of fire, and I'll read you my uh, assignment here. The title, Eternity in a Lake of Fire, A Study of the Future Destiny of the Lost. Hell first, then the lake of fire, and the reality of the judgment to come. And that's, that's what the lost have to look forward to. And, and God's prophetic time clock, those things are coming. Okay? Those things are coming. So it's a, it's a real neat three-point message that I have. What are the three points? Hell, lake of fire, and the judgment to come. So that's what we're going to look at. Let me ask you a question. Well, let, let me re let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to be here. And more importantly, Lord, to warn lost folks about hell and the judgment to come and the lake of fire. We pray, Lord, that people will listen and pay attention. And as we present the gospel over and over, that we'll have in our minds... These, these, these things here that lost people are looking forward to and that, that know nothing about. And we thank you for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Do you believe that people are going to be cast into a lake of fire? Do you believe that a loving God would do that? Would cast people into a lake of, of, of fire and brimstone? Well, he is. Those that reject truth, those that reject today in the dispensation of grace, the cross work of his son, those Christ rejectors are going to be the recipients of that. So today we're talking about lost people. Okay, keep that in mind. We're not talking about saved people. It's a different situation. We're talking about... And before I get started, I just wanted to echo something that Russ Hargett said yesterday. He kind of said it in passing, so I don't know if you noticed that or not. But as, as a preacher, a teacher, anytime you get a microphone in front of you, you need to give people the gospel, okay? Last September, my granddaughter got married. And as the case is, uh, I get a microphone, I always give the gospel. And the, the, about, about probably four minutes is about how long it took. Well, after, after the, the wedding ceremony was over, and you know how the groomsmen and, and the ladies come out and they walk down? One of, the, one of the groomsmen, he came out, and I'm sitting way off over the side, kind of out of the way. He come, and he left that young, and he come over and he shook hands with me. I'd never met the guy before in my life. He got saved. Don't, don't ever pass up that opportunity. You know, I was flabbergasted at first. You know, and it took me about 30 seconds, and I realized that guy got saved today. And he had a real good testimony. He talked to everybody afterwards, you know. and He'd been to church all of his life. Had never heard the gospel. Had never heard the gospel. So never passed. And I've had the same thing happen at funerals. So again, when, when Russ Hargett said that, he knew what he's talking about. So don't, don't ever pass that opportunity up, Okay. Every lost person faces hell. They face the great white throne judgment and lake of fire. Keep that in your mind as you're talking about these because we've got, we, we, we got a purpose in giving the gospel. It's just not to fill up space. So that, that's what we have to do. And they face that, and to those that face that today in the dispensation of grace are those that reject what our Savior did on the cross of Calvary. Christ died for our sins. Those that believe and trust in what Christ did on the cross of Calvary are saved, and they're saved from what I will be talking to you about today. Okay? It's a big deal. It's very, very important. Okay? And remember, body of Christ, we're already caught up a thousand years before that that uh, great white throne judgment takes place. We're in heaven and we're watching all this transpire. You know, you talk to a lot of people over the years, don't we? I remember many, many years ago, I talked to a man named Frank. And he told me that he believes that when we die, that it's over with. You just go to the grave and that's it. 
I talked to another guy, and he, he believed, and he told me, well, all the good saved people, they go to heaven, everybody else just goes to the grave. Recently, I talked to another lady, and she said, it don't matter what church you go to. We just all go to church. Then when we all die, we just all go to heaven. People believe a lot of different things. Okay? People believe a lot. It doesn't matter what people believe unless they believe what God believes. Okay? None of those three scenarios are true. Because God doesn't believe any of those things. People believe different things for what reason? To get around being accountable to God. Because every individual is accountable to God. And it's not true just because they believe that. God believes that a lost person at death goes quickly into hell. And they're going to stay there at least a thousand years until the judgment takes place. And then that judgment takes place and that lost person then is cast into a lake of fire. That's what God believes. That's what God teaches in the written word of God. And again, I want to say to it, remind you, you know, people are really willing and happy and they always want to talk about God's love. God's love was demonstrated on the cross at Calvary. And if that's rejected, people are in a world of hurt, aren't they? They're in a world, an eternity of hurt, and, and they don't want to do that. Hell is real. You know, it's popular at funerals to say what? Well, they're in a better place. That's a very popular thing to say at funerals. And I don't care what funeral you go to, that's what they're going to say. Maybe never even been to church, don't even know anything. Well, they're in a better place, aren't they? Well, I don't know if they are or not. There's a real good chance that they're not in a better place. Most of the time, in my opinion, they're not in a better place. They're, they're, they're in hell. Okay? That's where they're at many times. You know, Romans chapter... Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans 5, 8. Romans 5, 8 says what? That God's love was demonstrated where? On the cross at Calvary. God's love for mankind was demonstrated in that, Christ went to that cross at Calvary and died on that cross at Calvary. Why? To pay for your sins and to pay for my sins. That's where his love was demonstrated. No place else. There. And when an individual in the dispensation of grace rejects that, God's love is no longer there for them. When they reject his love demonstrated at Calvary, Okay, because Romans 1.16 tells us all of his power to salvation is vested in the cross of Calvary. No matter how good they are, how bad they are, none of that has anything to do with it. It has to do with whether or not they believe and accept what Christ did on the cross of Calvary, that Christ paid for their sins. Psalms chapter 55, verse 15. Psalms chapter 55, turn with me there. Psalms chapter 55, verse 15. Let death seize upon them, and let them go down quick into hell, for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. At death, the Bible teaches, a lost man goes quickly, immediately down into hell. A saved person, what happens to them at, at death? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So you have two different destinations there, one for lost people and one for saved people. And that's as true as, as, as you'll ever hear. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, if you read those two verses, God hates sin, the verses say. God hates sin. 
Well, the best description of, of hell in the Bible, no doubt, is Luke chapter 16, is it not? So we're going we're gonna to look at we're gonna look Luke chapter 16. And as we're looking at Luke chapter 16, this is the destination of lost people, all lost people throughout all ages. This is their destination. It's Luke chapter 16. I won't spend a whole lot of time because you all know this very, very well, but there, there's a few that don't, and they need to know about this. Luke chapter 16, and in Luke chapter 16 here, uh, Jesus Christ is, is the writer here, and he's given us an account of two people that died, okay? One's lost and one's saved. One rejected the truth for the people living at that time, in, in time past here. And it says, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, that's where he was, okay? Two different destinations. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he, dip, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. That's a picture of hell. You know, people like to crack jokes. You know, I'm going to go to hell where all my friends are and drink beer and, and, and with Satan. No. No, that's, that's not what it is. This is hell, okay? This is, this is the picture that we need to paint for a lost person so that they know and understand the difference. You know, everybody had, had this old growth. They'll say, well, go to hell. If you understand what hell is, you would never say that to anybody. I don't want nobody to go to hell. My worst enemy, I wouldn't want them to go to hell. It's a dangerous, it, it, it's horrible, it's a horrible place. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and, there, and you're tormented. Besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fix, so that you so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. There, there is a great gulf fix between heaven and hell. Well, now back here, th th this is a different situation here in time past. It's a little bit different because today, paradise is moved to the third heaven, and today the whole thing's hell, Okay? The whole thing is hell. God changed that a little bit. But there's a great gulf fix. You, you know, that issue of purgatory is a lie. Okay? That's a lie. There's a great gulf fix. You can't get from one to the other. That's what Jesus Christ says here. He's writing here in red letters. <laughs> Verse 27, then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house, for, for I've got five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they come into this place of partying, having a good time, torment. It's a place of torment. It's a place of fire. And a little drop of water on his tongue, he thought that would be a wonderful thing. And it probably would but to give you the ideal of being in those flames to where one drop of, you know, your tongue would be the part that would hurt the most. You ever burn your, that, that type of thing. Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they, they will repent. And he said, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. They had the book. See, that, that rich man, he's in hell, and he's got five brothers. And what was he thinking? 
my five brothers, they're going to be here in this same torment that I'm in. They need to know. He had memory recall. He, he knew things that was going on. And, and, and he, he knew Abraham here in the passage. There's things, people know stuff in hell. It's a real place, but people know stuff. And it's, and it's a reality. See? It, it, it's real. I want you to understand that it's real. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. We're going to look a little bit here at, uh, at judgment. Judgment is real. Hell is real. The lake of fire is real. All these things are real because the Word of God tells us about them. Romans chapter 1, verse 18, as Paul begins to tell us about judgment, he, and, and he says in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. How do you hold the truth in unrighteousness? By not believing it. That's how you hold it in unrighteousness. The truth today in the dispensation of grace is that Christ died for your sins. You hold that in unrighteousness by not believing God that Christ paid for your sins. See, judgment's coming. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who hold the truth of who hold the truth in unrighteousness, verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. You know, you're gonna have people say, Well, there's people that don't know. I had somebody recently say, I, they know. They, how do the, God says they know. They know. And that knowledge that God put in them and in the universe should drive them to understand what God's doing and what he's not doing. But God says that they know. So if God says they know, I believe they know. Chapter 2, verse uh, 2. Romans chapter 2, verse 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things, and doest the thing, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Do you, no one is going to escape the judgment of God. No one is. Now people think they are. No one's going to escape it. Or despise thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God... Today, see, God's long-suffering, and he's waiting. People, people deny him. They do all these gosh-awful things, and people say, well, why don't God get them? He's withholding his wrath, isn't he? He's with, uh, it's coming. Brother John told us about it last night. It's coming. Judgment's coming. And God says, I will repay. Vengeance is mine. Says, it's coming. It just hasn't fallen yet. But it's coming. Verse 5, after thy hardness and impotent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. God says that is a righteous judgment. It's the right thing to do. Judgment is right, God says. And it's a righteous judgment who will render to every man according to his deeds. Every individual is going to get what they deserve, exactly what they deserve, no more, no less. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life, for the person that never sinned, <laughs> eternal life. What's the problem with that? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then no one qualifies there. You don't and I don't. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew. There is no respect. Everybody, they're going to get what they deserve. What God says they do, and, and it's coming, and it's real. There's uh, Psalms chapter 7, verse 11. Psalms chapter 11, 7, verse 11 says, God is angry with the wicked every day. 
You know, there, there's this thing about, uh, well, God separates the sin from the sinner. I don't think I believe that. I believe the sin is attached to the sinner. That verse says God is angry with the way. It doesn't say God's angry with their sin, and he is that. But that, that wicked, unsaved individual, they own that sin. And God's angry with the wicked every day, it says there. In uh, 2 Kings chapter, well, let's, let's go here. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 17. You know, sometimes maybe, maybe we don't preach enough hell far. You know, back when I was a kid, boy, that was preached. And that's what caused me to believe. <laughs> I didn't want to be a part of this. 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 18. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel. Why was he angry with Israel? Because they were disobedient. They weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. And he was angry with them. The whole nation. He was angry with them for their being disobedient. Verse 25. Verse 25. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them which slew some of them. You think God would do that? He was angry with these guys. They were disobedient. He sent lions in there and they killed a bunch of them Israelites that were disobedient. We don't preach enough of this stuff. God does not like wicked, sinful Christ rejectors. Okay? He doesn't. Turn with me to Psalms chapter 9, verse 17. He loves them enough that he died for them on the cross at Calvary to pay for their sins. But boy, when they reject that, there's no hope, is there? There's no hope. Psalms, chapter 9, verse 17. Let me get there. Psalms, chapter 9, verse 17. Oh, I'm in the wrong. It wasn't looking right. I was in the wrong chapter. Psalms chapter 9, verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Again, definition of wicked. Those that reject God's plan of salvation in any dispensation. They're wicked, okay? And God's going to turn them into hell, and that's common. Look at verse uh, 3. Next chapter. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and bless the covetous whom the Lord abhors. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. See, the, God calls them wicked when they reject him. God calls them wicked and that's what they are when they reject what Christ did for them. And at the time, you know, you might not see those people as wicked. You probably don't see them as wicked, those re that reject Christ. You probably look at them and pat them on the shoulder and hug them, and, and, and that's okay. God says they're wicked. You know why that is? Because your standard and God's standard is different. God, if they reject the cross work of Christ, I mean, they're, they're, in a, they're in a world hurt. And God calls them wicked, okay? And they're going to be judged one day. And we need to be about reminding them and telling them and warning them about all that. We won't go to this passage, but there's a passage in Numbers chapter 11 that talks about God's anger was kindled and he burned a place. Look at Numbers chapter 25. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers 
chapter 25. This is interesting. Numbers chapter 25, verse 1. And we're going to read down through here, and there's a plague in Israel. It's a plague of sin. Sin had taken over. And he says, uh, what, what verse am I going to here? Uh, verse 1. And Israel abode in Chittin, and the people came to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did, it, did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the... Listen, you do not ever want to be in a position to have the anger of the Lord kindled against you. And that's what's going to happen at the great white throne judgment. These people here have got the Lord angry. He's angry at them, and his anger is going to be kindled against these folks. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. You need to understand, God hates sin. And God's wrath is going to be poured out upon sin. And people need to know how God feels about sin. And we almost need to take the mindset that God has, maybe, and view sin a little differently than maybe we do. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay every one of his men that were joined to and unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a uh, Midian Tesh woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle and the congregation. And when Phehas, the son of Elazor, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand and he went in after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and so the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. There was a plague of sin. They were disobedient to God. See? And you know what stopped that plague of sin? Punishment. That's what happened right there. He put that sword right through the, that guy's back, right through the belly of the woman that they had been instructed and told, stay away from them. See? And if you're going down and reading in, in, in verses 14 and 15, he identifies that man and that woman that were involved and tells you all about them, who their parents were, their names. God don't like sin, see? God don't like sin. And, it, and, it's, a, and it's, a, it's a bad situation. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says, the wrath of God is coming because of sin. God's wrath's coming, people. John talk, told us about it last night. But his wrath is coming, see? At death, lost people go quickly down into hell. We read about the rich man, see? And we read about the saved individual there. Immediately at death, that's where people go. And, that's, that's where, and there, there's degrees of punishment in hell in there. We have to cross out some things here just for time's sake. There's degree, you know, everybody's not going to have the same punishment in hell. I mean, you think about that. A righteous God, he's not going to do that. There's going to be, I don't know all about that part, but there are going to be degrees of punishment in hell. You know, you can read about that in Matthew chapter 10 and Matthew chapter 10, 11 and 15, Matthew chapter 11, verses 21 and 22. And he talks about the different degrees of punishment for these cities that are involved in sin based upon the sinful activities that they're involved in. But there will be different degrees, according to God's work, in, in, in hell, you know. And just, just like heaven has different degrees of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ based upon your works, in hell there's going to be different degrees of punishment. I mean, you think about that, that's only the right thing to do. And, and, and the book says it, he's a righteous God. You think about some little old lady that's always been good 
and some guy that's killed a bill, you know, that, that, that's murdered ten folks and raped and ravished. There are, God says there's going to be uh, those different degrees of punishment. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, there, uh, verses 5 through 9 says, it's a righteous judgment that God's going to do. And it's the right thing to do. You might disagree. I might disagree with what God's going to do, but that don't amount to a hill of beans. You see, because God's God. And God's going to do what he said he's going to do. And the wrath is coming like John told us last night. Hell's coming. Judgment's coming. And the lake of fire's coming. All of that stuff's going to happen. You see? Now, that... Great white throne judgment, that's at least a thousand years away. But you know that loss, that, that rich man that we read about? He's still there. He's still there. Wishing he had a drop of water to put on his tongue. It's real, folks, is what I'm trying to say to you. These things are real. And we need to warn people and tell people about these things. You don't want nobody that you know or nobody that you don't know to stand before an angry God for judgment. You don't want that for nobody you know, your worst enemy. Now, when we get to, to Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 here, it's, it's a courtroom scene. When we get to, to the great right throne judgment, everybody that's there is already guilty. You know, you go to a court and you're pronounced guilty. And then you come back sometime later for what? For your sentence. And the judge gives you what, gives you what you're, that's what's going on here in, in this uh, great white throne judgment. It's the court, because it's God's courtroom. And God's going to dish out, if you will, the punishment for those individuals based on what? And the books were opened based on their works, okay? That's what it's going to be judged on. Now, I skipped a couple of passages in here that where some people said, God won't judge us. God will forget. He will, God will forget what we did. I, I, just for time's sake, I had to skip some things. Like, you, like all the brothers say, you start out with 10 or 15 pages, you've got to narrow it down. And that's the case, you see. And, and, and that, that's what's going on here. There's degrees of punishment in hell. And it's going to be a righteous judgment. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. Again, it's a courtroom scene. And you, and you need to... Uh, now, I want to go to this one passage that talks about degrees of punishment. Turn with me, if you will, real quickly to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, verse 14. Apparently, it seems to me, that God hates some sin worse than he hates other sin. Now that might sound kind of strange, and maybe that's not true, but for, when I read the Bible, that's what it appears to me. Matthew chapter 23, verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour window, widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer. There, therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Greater than what? Greater than someone that didn't do this, apparently. It's how I take that. Now, what are these people doing here that, that, that God says they're going to receive the greater dam, damnation? What, what are they doing, these scribes and these uh, Pharisees? Well, I'm glad you asked. Verse 25. Verse 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but, but within are full of extortion and excess. 
What's he talking about here, this extortion? Whose house is he in? He's in the widow, the widow's house. What happened to that widow? Her husband died. And he's extorting money for him for what purpose? To get him out of purgatory. It's extortion money that he's getting from these people. And God calls it like it is. It's extortion. And apparently God hates this. Because they're going to have a greater damnation, the Bible says. A greater damnation. Uh, I'd like to spend a little more time on that, but you know, time, you, 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 you see, maybe I shouldn't say that. There are degrees of punishment in hell, okay? And we looked at this one here with, with extortion. Turn to, look at Mark chapter 12, verse 38. Mark 12, 38, quickly. Mark chapter 12, verse 38. Mark chapter 12, verse 38. And he said unto them in his doctrine. Who's the he? It's Jesus Christ speaking. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplace and the chief seats and the synagogues and the uttermost rooms at feasts which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. What's those, what's those long prayers that's a pretense? <laughs> they're pretending to pray about something. And they're praying about the biggest fundraiser in Catholicism. <laughs> that's purgatory. Purgatory, it brings in money, a lot of money. And they go into these widows' houses and they extort them. Jesus Christ said and he calls it extortion. It's extortion money. It ain't no different than if you go into some businessman and you offer him protection for a certain amount of money. It's the same thing. God said it, and God hates that. And God says there's a greater damnation. So there's got to be a greater damnation. And however it is that God, God deems that necessary, that's what it is. Okay? Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 20 and we'll look at that a bit more. This judgment, I'm sorry, this great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20 verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things. For Now you've got to, got, to, got to get the idea here. There's, a, there's the books, plural, and then there's another book, the book of life. Now in that book of life is those, those individuals that endured to the end and, and made it through that thousand years tribulation. But there's a, another set of books, and in that other set of books are God recorded the lost man's works. And he's going to be judged out of that other set of books. And it, it says here, judged out of those things which were written in the... God wrote them. He didn't forget, did he? I don't think I read the verse that, that, that they were saying, well, God will forget. No. Apparently it's written down in those books. And those folks are going to be judged out of those books. And they're already in hell. And they're going to be judged and cast where? Into a lake of fire. That's, that's reality. That is just as real as you sitting there in that chair. It's real. And that's what these, these folks face that. And we need to believe it and understand it like God believes it. Verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in you know that guy that I told you about in the beginning that said that he believed that everybody just dies and that's the end of it? Well, he, he's dead now. And you know where he's at? He's a relative of mine. He passed away. And as far as I know, he never believed anything different. 
He's in a lake of fire today. And he's awaiting this great white throne judgment. Along with all the other dead. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written, written in the book of life was cast where? Into a lake of fire. That's the eventual doom. The, on God's prophetic clock, that's where lost people, their eventual end is in that lake of fire. And you know what's in a lake of fire? Yeah. You know what's in a lake of water? See? All lost people at the moment of death, just like saved people are absent body be present with the Lord, all lost people go down quickly into hell, the Bible teaches. That's that theory. See, you don't want nobody. If, if, you're, if you're here or listening, and if you're not sure if you're going to go to heaven when you die, you're probably not. If you're not sure, you're probably not. And you know what you need to do if you're not sure? God tells you what to do. God tells you what to do to, so that Christ can have paid for your sin debt. And if you don't do that, you're going to be the victim of God's wrath that we've been talking about this morning. And you don't want that. You see... Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says that we are all sinners. You know what all means? That means I'm a sinner. I knew at a, at a time and, and, and day in my life, I knew I was a sinner, and I knew that if when I died, I was going to split hell wide open. I knew about hell. And eventually, I trusted in what my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, did for me. So if you're a sinner, I got good news for you. God wants to pay for your sin so that you don't have to pay for it in a lake of fire. Okay? God wants you to know something that his son did for you on the cross at Calvary. Okay? God wants you to know that so that you can be sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die. To be absent from, and not go the other direction, which is down. Those are the only two options. Okay? And we've been looking at them this morning. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 says that Christ died for the ungodly. That's me. At one point in time in my life. And that's you. If you've never trusted in him. And if you've never believed what he did for you. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, what? Christ died for you. And he died for me. But if you reject that, there's no hope. There's no hope for you. God's love is not a part and outside of what he performed for you on the cross at Calvary. Okay? You own your sins. You own your sin unless you allow our Savior to own it for you. And that's what he does. That's what he does. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died. Is that the end of the verse? No. Christ died. Why did he die? For your sins. Christ died for your sins. That's why he died. Well, I don't believe that. Well, if you don't believe it, you're going to go down into hell and be with the rich man. Christ died for your sins for a reason and a purpose. Okay? What you have to do and what I had to do was to believe God, Christ died for your sins. And the moment that you believe that, 
then Christ paid for your sins and God's righteousness, the fact that he never sinned, his righteousness is imputed to you. And in God's eyes, it's as though you never sinned because his righteousness is imputed to you. What a deal. If you've never done that, if you've never done that, don't wait another minute. Right this minute, all you have to do is believe God that Christ died for your sins and he paid for your sins on the cross at Calvary and you're saved. You're saved from that mess we've been studying this morning and, you, and you're going to be, after, when you die, you're going to be present with the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this morning for what your son accomplished for us on the cross at Calvary when we went there and died and paid our sin debt. We're so grateful and thankful that he did that and that we have the knowledge of knowing and understanding that so that we can believe the gospel. We thank you for that. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.